In this video, I want to show you the process of briefing your interpreter. So I have footage from an actual briefing with an interpreter that I'm going to share with you. Ah, there you are. I'm Perfect. Ella. I'm Nika. Nika, so nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. Yes, and thank you so much for agreeing to help us with, with the interpreting. Of course, of course. So tell me a little bit about your background. Have you have you worked as an interpreter? I do a lot of translation by volunteering, helping foreigner because I basically the center of uh, English at Khmer between the, the donors and the sponsor and the volunteers and the kids and the uh -huh. staff. Okay, okay. So you've I aware. I, I want to kind of t give you a little bit of background on what we are doing. Um, okay. What our goal is, well, what we're doing right now, we call the, the interpreter briefing, okay. um, which is, there are three parts in this process. So there's the briefing where I'm going to talk to you about what we're going to do. Um, there's the inner, we call it the interaction. That's our testing session where we will have a child present who we are evaluating. And then after the evaluation, we'll have a debriefing where we talk through pieces of it. I'm a speech language pathologist and my job is to evaluate students and determine whether they have a speech or language impairment or whether they don't. For our children who come from other language backgrounds, what happens too often is that kids get, get labeled as language impaired or speech yeah. impaired when they're really not. When two languages interact, there are a lot of yeah. patterns that happen. And so we need to just think about what those are. And that's what helps us differentiate a disorder from just patterns that exist because we have two languages in our system. Okay. So, and we have terms that we use. So speech means the sound production, like articulation and phonology yeah. um, the sounds they create, as opposed to language, which is their vocabulary and how they put words together. We will work together as a team to do that. My job is to um, bring the information to you that says this is these are the similarities and differences between Kamai and, and English. So think of this like a Venn diagram. So we have the sounds of standardized American English. We have the sounds of your language. And some of those are overlapping and some are unique to one language or the other. So if I see a child who's making errors only on the sounds that are unique to English that don't exist in Kamai, then I'm, to me, that's like, oh, that's an influence. That is not a disorder. I got you. I got okay. you because I have that issues myself that I work very hard with audio books to listen, like to correct myself so that I can speak a bit clearer so people can understood a little bit clearer instead of like, uh, misunderstand with the with the pronunciations i got you i understand yes that. okay so and so you know those patterns you are well schooled then in the patterns that are typical for a child from cambodia who's moved here to the u.s what are the sound patterns that you might expect to hear you're going to know those yes so once i've finished talking about the differences and similarities in speech sounds then i move on to language and i talk about what English and Khmer look like in comparison for that. So in this case, here's my messy contrast of analysis for Khmer and English. And I talk about word order and how questions are formed and the different the differences that we expect to see so that when my interpreter is gathering information, they have an awareness of what I am looking for. So then when we get to the post-evaluation part, the debriefing, we both have walked into it with a sense of what we're looking for and it makes that part of the process go much smoother.